The GX85 was released in 2016 and it was kind of positioned as a tier below the stills focused flagship by Panasonic, the GX8. 2016 was a while ago, so how well does the GX85 stack up in 2024? Before I get stuck in, this camera is called different things in different areas. It's called the GX85, the GX80, and in some regions, the GX7 Mark II. I'm going to call it the GX85 because that's what my model is and my understanding is that's the most common name for it out there. Let's get stuck into image quality. This camera has a 16 megapixel sensor and that doesn't sound amazing, but it doesn't have an anti-aliasing filter. The fact that that filter isn't here on the camera means that you get a much more kind of sharper looking image in my experience. Here is an image taken with the GX85. Here it is taken with the GX8. Here it is with the G9 Mark II. And here it is with the G9 Mark II in high res mode. You can also recover quite a bit of detail in images that you shoot with this camera. That doesn't mean you're going to rescue an image that's severely underexposed, but if you're taking a landscape shot and you want to bring up your shadows, or if you're doing street photography and you want to reveal a bit of information that's there in the shadows, like a door or something, you can do that here completely. I'd have no problems giving an image from this camera a heavy edit and then printing it to A1 size. And if it's something that you like, we do have a lot of fun filters in this camera. Most of these are just kind of an increase in contrast and sharpness, but some of them are kind of fun and interesting, like the star filter. And if you shoot JPEG and RAW, you know, this will only affect your JPEGs and then you still have your RAW files for a proper edit afterwards. But some people like getting images straight out of camera and these are pretty fun. We also have in-body stabilization in this camera, which means that you can get a longer shutter speed than you'd expect. And the reason I like this in cameras is to get a handheld long exposure effect and it just means that you can shoot in darker environments than you'd be able to without. And if you're in a very dark environment, we do have this little pop-up flash. It's not amazing, but it does the job, and I quite like to kind of hold it back with a finger to get it to bounce off a roof or a wall or something like that. I feel that gives a much more kind of natural look. So, something for me that's very important when I get a camera are the build quality and the ergonomics of the camera. So, let's talk about build quality first. It's well built. It's nice and heavy in the hand, all the buttons are nice and clicky, and the mechanism for the tilting screen is nice, it's not quite smooth, there's no like grain or stiffness to it. You would think you'd be able to flip the screen out a full 180 degrees, so you could kind of vlog with it, but you can't here, and I'll talk more about video later. You can also tilt the screen down the way, which is handy if you're shooting over a crowd, or what I like to use it for is when I'm filming stop motion with this camera so I can get a look at the screen. We also have an EVF here as well, and you know, it feels nice, but it's not great. It's kind of got some weird RGB shearing that's almost like when you'd look at a projector. Uh, like if you've ever been stood in front of a projector and you move your head and you can see like a rainbow effect, that's what you get here. It's also a very small EVF, um, both physically and the kind of like image you get displayed. Uh, if I wear my glasses, I wear glasses, I don't have them on now because I get a glare off the lights, you get quite a lot of leakage. I don't know if that's the right word, but you can see a lot of like around what you're trying to shoot. And it's just a very small image on the screen because it's a 16x9 screen displaying a 3x4 image, or 4x3 image rather. Last thing with the EVF, on cameras like the GX8 and the GX7, which this is considered the Mark II of in some regions, you can tilt the EVF up. Uh, you can't do that here. Your EVF is fixed in position, but it does the job. Ergonomics wise, the camera's really comfortable in the hand, even with a larger lens like my 12 to 60 which... I know it's not a large lens, but on a body like this, it kind of does seem a bit out of proportion. Where I like to use this body the most is with a small prime lens. So like the 20mm f1.7 by Panasonic, the 14mm f2.5 by Panasonic, which I have on at the moment, lovely tiny little pocket setup, and even the 17mm f1.8 by Olympus, which I'm filming this on. The reason I like to shoot with um, small prime is it makes this setup truly one-handed. You can turn the camera on and off, you can adjust all the settings, and you can not have to worry about zooming in or out. Whereas if I'm shooting with my 12 to 60, it's more of a two-handed setup. Of course, that's only true if you're not manually focusing or using a manual focus prime. Speaking of focusing, the autofocus on this is really nice and snappy. I mean, it's comparable to pretty much any Micro Four Thirds camera I have. So like the EM5 Mark II, the GX8, uh, the original G9. It's not quite as fast as the G9 Mark II, but of course that has phase detect autofocus and it's got a bunch of AI helping it out. What we do have on this is face tracking autofocus, which would be great for video, but you know, we're gonna talk about video in a bit. When you're looking through the EVF, you can use your thumb on the back screen, almost as a sort of trackpad to move your focus point around, which is cool. But to be honest, I just tend to tap where I want it to focus. Um, you have like your typical kind of Panasonic focusing here as well. You can choose a zone of focus points. You can choose a single point. And we do have post focusing here as well, which I feel is just a gimmick to be completely honest. It's never something I've used in a body, but it's there if that's something that you're interested in. Let's talk about the video capabilities of this camera. Now, I said I had a few things I wanted to talk about video, but what I'm gonna do here is compare it to its kind of big brother or cousin, 
some relative, the GX8. This camera is an upgrade and a downgrade from the video on the GX8. Like on the GX8, we have 4K video. That's good. Unlike the GX8, we can actually use the IBIS in this camera when we're filming video. That's very good. The small form factor of this camera means you can stick it on a gimbal quite easily. That's good. The screen flips out so you can shoot from the hip. That's good. And we don't have a mic input. That's quite bad. I know I could just use an external mic and record it to something like a Zoom H1N or even these little DJI microphones I'm using. You can record audio to these and just sync it in post. I don't like doing it. It's a bit of workflow that I just don't particularly care for. So what I'm gonna do now is give you snippets of the internal mic on this camera and a few different scenarios with and without some corrections. This is what the inbuilt mic on the GX80 or GX85 sounds like. I'm in a room that's not really acoustically treated. I'm in a room that's not really acoustically treated. So I'm talking to the GX85 right now. This is what the inbuilt mic sounds like. Um, hopefully the face tracking is doing a good job. This is being filmed in my 14mm f2.5. Hopefully the face tracking is doing a good job. This is being filmed in my 14mm f2.5. You might notice, I don't know how well YouTube compression is going to handle it, but sometimes with this camera, particularly if you're in a quiet environment and you're filming video, you can actually hear the IBIS working away. This is what the inbuilt mic... That makes sense. The IBIS is inside the camera working. The microphone is also inside the camera working. It's going to happen. But it's not something you'll notice in like a finished product. It's just something you might hear. So I will say the video out of this camera, besides audio, is actually quite nice and usable. The autofocus for this is, I think, quite usable if you're just kind of filming B-roll. And what I like to use this most for video is doing in-camera time lapses and stop motion. I know I could do that all just by taking images and sticking them in Final Cut, but that's a, you know, it's another bit of workflow. I'm quite a lazy person. Like if you want a stills camera that you'll occasionally do a bit of video with, this is quite usable. For me, I'm gonna be using this as sort of like an everyday camera when it's dry outside. We'll talk about that in a bit. And for a bit of video when I'm out and about, or even just for doing time lapses and stop motion, like I said, this is great because it's such a small little thing that you can just set up on a tiny tripod. So let's talk about strengths and weaknesses of this camera. Strength one is the form factor. I really like a tiny camera. It looks incognito when you're out and about, which is great because I don't want to get robbed. And also, you know, you can like take pictures and it doesn't look like you're taking professional photos. But with something like the 14 mil, the 20 mil, even the 17 mil I'm filming this on, it's a nice small pocketable setup. Image quality wise, for all it's only 16 megapixels, the removal of the anti-aliasing filter gives you really nice sharp images. The IBIS is nice to have because, you know, I can just go out with this setup and I can get good shots in low light. I can get a handheld long exposure effect and the fact it works with video just gives everything a smoother look. And my last kind of strength this camera is probably an unpopular one. I quite like that you charge the batteries in camera. So I bought this secondhand and it came with two third party batteries and a battery charger but I still prefer having the ability to charge your battery in camera. The reason I like in-camera charging is because if you're out for the day and you didn't bring spare batteries, you can just plug into a power bank and you're good to go. Uh, it also means that if I'm half asleep, I can just grab my camera that's been charging overnight and I can run out with it and I don't have to, you know, I've had situations where I've been half asleep, I've gone to grab my camera, I walk to wherever I'm going, I drive to wherever I'm going, and suddenly I realize I didn't bring a battery. So I can just charge the batteries in the camera and not have to worry about that. All right, weaknesses. The EVF is usable, but as a last resort, it's got that weird RGB sharing, and it's quite a small display due to it being a 16 by nine screen. Uh, no mic input is also a weakness for me. Yeah, there's the internal mics, and I could record to an external thing. I feel like if you have 4K video on a camera, you should have the option to have a mic in. Even if that means you have a sort of combination jack where let's say it's a two and a half mil, but it does your headphones, it does your like remote control and it does your mic. I'd rather something like that. The body also isn't weather sealed and I live in Ireland, it's raining at the moment. Don't know if you can hear it, but um, it means if I'm out and about, it just means I have to bring a waterproof bag with me and just kind of be more conscious of the weather forecast. But if you're thinking of doing street photography, I quite like doing street photography when it's a bright sunny day, you get them like hard contrasty shadows. This is great. And last weakness is actually on the note of the battery charging. I know I sung its praises a minute ago. So let's have a scenario. Let's say you're on holiday in Spain and you want to get a time lapse of the sunset or you want to get a time lapse of the night sky or something. You think, okay, cool, it does time lapses. It's got a USB micro B input to charge the camera. I can just plug this into a power bank, leave it on the balcony and everything will be grand. That's not the case. If you plug it in to charge the battery, but then go to use the camera, it's not gonna use and charge it at the same time. It's just gonna use the battery and it won't charge the battery. It's just a weird quirk of it, I guess. So I suppose in conclusion, I do really like this camera. I picked it up at CEX, which is like this kind of electronics reseller here in Ireland. Uh, I paid 220 euro for it and it came with two third-party batteries. 
You can find them on MPB for anywhere from 350 to 400 ish euro, depending on the condition. At this price point, yeah, there are other options. You could get yourself a GX8, you could probably even get an EM5 Mark II, depending on where you look. I think there's more to a camera than specs and price. How does it feel in the hand? How much does it make you want to go out and use it? They're important too. Character. And this body has a lot of character, even down to its little shutter sound. It's got such a lovely shutter sound. I think if you're going out traveling and you don't really need a weather sealed camera, something like this with either the Lumix 12 to 32 little pancake zoom, which is what I believe was actually the kit lens when this camera was released, or if you want a bit of extra reach, the 12 to 60 or a few primes, then I don't know, it's nice, it does the job. You are gonna see this camera appear on the channel. I'm gonna be using it for B-roll when I'm out and about. I'm gonna be using it for some street photography, just some general walkabout photography. So I wanna leave you with a question. If you own this camera, what situations do you use it in? And if you're thinking of getting this camera, what situations are you going to use it in? For me, this is gonna be a sort of second camera when I'm going out with my G9 Mark II, or it's gonna be a travel camera. It's gonna use for like getting bits of B-roll for the channel, stuff like that. And I don't know, for the price I saw it, I couldn't leave it.